Today we begin chapter 7 which continues our exploration of forces in members with a focus on being able to find the internal forces that appear in two very important types of engineering structures. The first is the beam and as you can see from these three examples here beams are quite widely used in a variety of uh, you know uh, support systems so example for example this roof here is being supported by this beam that runs across the house um, you can see such kind of extension beams around you uh, some of you might have gone to the Grand Canyon and walked out onto the cantilevered uh, ledge out here uh, so these are all examples of beams the other type of structure is the cable and uh, for example uh, those who have you know had uh, had uh, the good fortune to uh, see um, you know um, a winter resort or a winter location which has cable cars you'll notice that the cable cars run by uh, being supported on beams and the Golden Gate Bridge is another very good example and so uh, we have these two structures right uh, beams and cables now from a definition point of view beams are usually long uh, straight prismatic members that means their cross-section is not a circle but some kind of polygonal shape it can be a square uh, a rectangle and so on and so forth and of course these are de designed to support loads uh, and the loads may be applied um, either at, uh, at specific points as shown here or entirely along their length okay so so in this case you know um, you can think of this as either being concentrated loading uh, like p1 and p2 shown here and usually these loads are given in terms of newtons or pounds on the other hand you've seen examples of distributed uh, loading from the previous chapter uh, that's shown here and these loads are usually given in terms of newtons per meter uh, pound for pound per feet, things like that. Um, beams can also be classified on how they are supported. And uh, so, if you look at the top row here, we have a situation in, in which we can um, calculate uh, or we can uh, we can equate the number of um, unknown forces to the number of uh, equilibrium equations, which means it's a statically determinate system. And here is one example: it's a supported beam. Another one is this overhanging beam, and the third is the cantilevered beam. Right? On the other hand, you can also have supports here, where you have an additional support somewhere along the along the supported beam, as shown here. Uh, this adds uh, more um, more unknown forces, and now it becomes a statically indeterminate system. It may be uh, stable but indeterminate. Here's another example: the beam is fixed at one end and simply supported at the other end and a third one is a fixed beam okay now cables uh, you know they are flexible and uh, they're only capable of withstanding tension and uh, you can support uh, you can use cables to support either a concentrated load as shown here in this example or distributed loads right uh, they have many applications suspension bridges tramways transmission lines for example, your power uh, used to uh, as guy wires in tall towers. Normally, the problems you're dealing with in cables are really about what is the shape of the cable under under the loading condition and the tension in the various parts of the cable as you go along the length of the cable. Right? For example, what is the tension here versus here versus here, and so on. So let's begin with you know the simplest member uh, which is a straight two force member right and we have encountered these uh, members in the past and a two force member is that essentially there were only two forces being applied on it so the question now is you know uh, in this scenario here we know that the forces if uh, are equal and opposite so the member is in equilibrium that means it's not going to move or it's not going to have any kind of rotation so the question we want to understand is if I take a cut along some point along this member what is the nature of the force at, uh, uh, at that cut right so we're talking about what's the nature of the force inside the member and that means uh, you can also ask the question is what are the internal forces in this member so that the member is in equilibrium 
And the reason this kind of a question becomes important is that as you will see soon, we want to uh, be able to calculate what's happening on the inside because that helps us understand the kind of stresses that a material is being, is being exposed to. So the way you can solve this problem is by you take a cut at a given location. In this case, you know, uh, we've taken the cut at C. And now since the member is in equilibrium, we know that, you know, uh, for the portion AC, there is going to be uh, an equal and opposite force, uh, negative F as compared to F, right? And similarly for the member uh, part CB, uh, you introduce a force F now at C that compensates for the negative force uh, at B minus F. So just the addition of these two forces here at C basically allows the internal state uh, or allows the member to be in equilibrium. So we can say that internally there is a force acting along the axis of the member and so you need an axial force along the internal parts of the member along the member axis in order for this uh, system to be in equilibrium. So that's the first type of force we encounter. We call it the axial force that acts on the inside of the member. Okay, okay. now let's look at this example here where we have again we have a two force member but now this member is bent and so uh, again the system is in if you look at the free body it's in equilibrium because we have two equal and opposite forces at A and C and so the system is not moving now let's ask the question again so what is the internal state of the member and let's say we want to analyze it at uh, at point D where we take a slice okay so let's see what's going on here now so I take a cut uh, at C at, at point D and so I have a system like this so I'm just going to blow it up here right so originally we had F uh, acting at point A and now we want to calculate what's happening at D so clearly in order to prevent this from moving I need to first apply a force that's going to be in this direction right so uh, so F will act in this so a new force is going to act in this direction here but immediately you see that if I put this new force this whole thing is going to try to rotate so that means I need to have a compensating moment also being applied here let me call it M now this force itself can be broken up into two components one is along the axis F and along the perpendicular to the axis and let's call it V so you see now that we have a system where the original force F um, or actually let me call the original force P which is what we have in the figure leads to uh, on the uh, leads to an internal state where there is uh, a moment that needs to be applied to compensate for the couple the force couple that is formed due to the fact that we have a force along the axial direction and a force tangential to it okay so what that means is that here we need to have three different things happening we need the axial force F that prevents uh, uh, the motion along the F direction uh, or along the axial direction then we have an internal force couple system that requires to be applied uh, and this is shown as moment M in the figure here in order to compensate for that couple that is formed and finally we have a new force called the shear force which is V now which is acting uh, parallel to uh, or tangential to the surface of the member and perpendicular to the axial force so we have these three things that have appeared now let's try an example of the multi-force member you know this is something that we have explored previously in terms of looking at uh, equilibrium today we'll break it up and cut it up and look at the internal forces inside it so what we are going to ask is you know if you look at member AD uh, what are the internal forces uh, that are required to keep the member in equilibrium so we can begin by you know of course uh, freeing up AD uh, so we have uh, the tension here that appears from this wire CD that's connected here and of course at point C we have uh, two forces CX and CY and then at point B we have uh, force FBE that's acting along this direction here okay so that's what is shown here and then we have the support at A so we have AX and AY so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it off at, uh, at this uh, position J here which is shown and ask the question what is happening at J which is the in, which is at the internal position of this member in terms of the forces so we'll see that um, essentially because of the fact that we have this tension here 
uh, and the fact that we have um, CX acting in the uh, X direction we need to be able to uh, keep it in order to keep it in equilibrium we need to add uh, basically a uh, again a moment here which is going to compensate for the couple and the shearing force V here just like in the previous case again we have an axial force F a bending moment cup M from the force couple system and a shearing force V so uh, what you should do is you should blow this up and draw it and figure out uh, you know uh, how this actually appears uh, so that you're confident with being able to draw these kind of systems and making sure that what you're trying to do here is you're making sure that that little piece that you've cut off is not moving in the x and y direction and is not rotating and so you need to add all the necessary forces and moments in order to prevent that from happening because after all this is in equilibrium okay, okay. so now let's go ahead and uh, apply this idea to an example problem and what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, take this problem and break it up and answer the question of uh, what is the internal force in member ACF at the point J? So J is marked right here. So if you want, you can pause the video and think through this and then come back and work through it. So the step one is, is a step that we have always been doing, which is, you know, use the FPD of the entire structure to find the various reaction forces. So obviously at point E, I have a uh, force EY and EX. So EX and EY, right? And at force Y, uh, at position F, I only have one force here. I call it Fy because it's a movable roller joint. So, um, so given that uh, this is the situation, you know, I can um, find the reaction forces by first saying, okay, let me take the moment about E because I have two forces there. Uh, and so uh, the moment about E comes from two terms. One is the 2400 Newton term here which is at a distance of 3.6 meters as shown here right so that's this term and the other one is due to F which is shown here and that is at a distance of 4.8 newtons and you can see that the 240 is acting down but we have assigned the F to act up so they are in opposite directions so the two moments are in opposite directions and so our final force uh, F in the y direction is 1800 newtons next we can do equilibrium in forces uh, and we'll find that fx uh, is basically uh, since the summation fx is zero that means ex this is this term here is zero and when you do the summation in the y we'll find that ey is 600 newtons okay so that gives us our um, our solution for the for the reaction forces so now step two is we want to now solve for the internal forces uh, at j so we need to first dismantle the member and draw the free body diagrams. So here are the three members now uh, involved and we've drawn the free body diagram for each. And now we want to look to see um, what additional uh, forces are appearing uh, in each of the members because these are multi-force members. Remember? So they're not uh, two-force members, they're multi-force members. So what we can do now is go ahead and solve for uh, so since you're interested in, in in J which is in this member here we're going to I'm going to just focus the solution uh, on uh, on this body here okay so so let's evaluate what's happening in member AB again this is applying our equilibrium conditions uh, and trying to find the unknowns so the first step is that if I take the moment about A uh, the only force that acts uh, to produce a moment is is bx and so I immediately see that bx is zero next I can use the equations in x and y for the forces uh, if you look at the fx we see that since bx is zero so now ax is also zero and finally we're left with fy and here uh, we find that ay is equal to 1800 newtons but I have taken a shortcut because in order to calculate by we actually need to first solve for uh, equilibrium in this member here and so go ahead and try that and you should then end up getting that PY is 12, 1200 newtons which then leads us to uh, finding out that AY is 1800 newtons okay so now that we've solved for um, that member our final part is now to take that member ACF 
uh, I'm sorry actually we, we wanted to uh, solve for this one here but the reason we solved ABE is because it allows us to find the values for A uh, we've already found C from the first step which I have skipped so you need to do that and so now finally we are going to be looking at uh, this member here in order to um, find what's happening at point J so I have cut ACF at J and and now we're going to take a moment and draw all the necessary forces that are needed there so we've drawn the internal force F and we see that because of uh, A if you look at it uh, I have X axis along this direction Y axis along this direction in order for the member to um, to not move along the Y axis uh, since I have a component of A that acts AY here I need to add V here to prevent that motion right so V is the shear force that appears and now finally if you see uh, AY and V they basically tend to rotate the uh, the system like this and so I have to add a compensating moment here in the opposite direction right so now now that we have uh, set up the internal forces that appear there and the internal moments that appear there we can uh, go ahead and uh, solve for for the uh, for the system through using the equilibrium condition so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the moment about point J and um, so if I take point J and calculate I have moments coming from from essentially uh, uh, the the force here which is acting at point A which is 1800 newtons and this is going to give us um, uh, uh, and, and of course we also have a moment that's acting at point J already so we can't uh, ignore that and so this allows us to now relate the unknown moment internal bending moment M to the the forces that are applied and that shows us that M the bending moment is going to be 2160 Newton per meter okay. um, so let's see I think we are good here uh, maybe I'm missing an angle uh, here so double check that value I think we should be doing um, 1800 Newton times 1.2 times uh, a sine of uh, 41.7 degrees so please double check that number right and see if that's what gives you 2160 okay so now um, uh, if I look at equilibrium in forces I look at the X and the Y direction and what that helps us do is that it of course gives us the axial force F that's this one here and the ten tangential or shear force V that's this one here right and so you should get these numbers here 1344 and 1197 Newton and so that completes the solution uh, that allows us to find the internal forces and the moment uh, acting at point J in the member right? okay so now as an exercise go ahead and do this uh, problem and find out what's happening at point K in terms of the internal forces okay uh, okay so let's let's wrap up this discussion uh, today we've introduced two engineering structures beams and cables and defined what they are and then we went on to um, look at the uh, look at the internal equilibrium in a beam and we find that um, you need to have uh, axial forces, shear forces and a bending moment um, that are, are required to completely describe the internal equilibrium state of a beam. Okay. Thank you.